everybody. Wanted to welcome you to the Life and Listings podcast. I have my friend Charis joining us here from California. We've known each other for a few years now, and I'm so excited to have you here today. Awesome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. It's very kind of you to invite me on, so I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, what you're doing now, and kind of where you, you came from. Sure. Well, where I came from is a fun story because, you know, you want to know how <laughs> you know where someone's from and you want to know if they're a Texan. You don't have to ask them. They'll tell you. Um, so I started my, my life in the state of Texas, um, Southeast Texas, probably the worst part or the best part of that state. So I'm from Southeast Texas, very 98 miles Southeast of Houston. And I have been in real estate. Actually, August this year was 20 years. Um, so basically, you know, when I started when I was five and now I am the vice president of sales for a company called Nextel. We are a national real estate franchise, also a partner in this company. Um, so that's really exciting I to work with uh, seven of my best friends. I'll say six and a half because Jim has just started with us. So he's on, <laughs> a, but he's getting there. And then um, um, I started my career in a, by an, it was an accident. I had just quit my job in retail and I was going to go back to school. Uh, I always wanted to be a nurse. Uh, that was what I have always aspired to be when I graduated high school. I was a CNA. I had done a two year nursing, a pre nursing program called HOSA, Health Occupation Students of America. So now I'm still at nursing in a, in a way. I triage, I just triage adults in their business. As <laughs> You know, the people that, you know, come into facilities or hospitals. Um, so I, I still triage. It's just, it's a very different way, but it brings a lot of meaning. So when I started in this industry, a really good friend of mine who's actually the best man in our wedding, uh, my husband's uh, best friend, and he was working at realtor.com and they were having a hiring fair. And they basically said, if you can get people to come in and interview with us, we'll pay you 500 bucks. So he called me because he knew he was like, hey, I know you're not interested in working right now, but you got to come out. You got to do this. I'm going to make 500 bucks. I said, great. You make 250. I make 250. <laughs> so I went and they offered me a position. Um, I declined it three times because their salary was really low. It was like a third of a third of a third of what I was making uh, in my in retail. And um, we ended up finally negotiating and I ended up, you know, coming on and by the time I left, I was the vice president of sales uh, at about uh, probably a little over 200 sales, inside salespeople, 11 teams of managers that, that rolled up through me. But ultimately, it was great. Probably the, I mean, it's one of the best uh, starts in the industry. And then from there, I went to Trulia and I ran their broken franchise sales all west of the Mississippi. And then um, from there, I met James, who is the CEO and co-founder of Nextel. And uh, we became really good friends. And uh, Tay, I don't think he liked me very much, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm that effect on people. And he's like, I don't know. She seems a little off. She's not very organized. <laughs> oh, no. um, kind of all over the place. But Jane saw something, um, and I still ask him to this day. And I remember when, you know, it was in New York the first time, and he says, hey, um, we're going to be opening a new real estate franchise, and I would love for you to be part of it. And I said, no, thank you. I think that we have enough franchises in this industry. Maybe you could fix the ones we have. And he basically kind of laid out the vision, and it really did interest me. But I was working at Trulia. You know, we had just gone public, and... Uh, there was so many things that we were working on, and I really, really loved what I was doing. And I really felt that the portal side of the business was the future of real estate. And uh, we had such an incredible opportunity to bridge, you know, one side of the industry, your buyers and sellers, to the other, the, the, to the, the, the part of the industry that actually creates home ownership, right? And then I finally... You know, James broke me down, and in reality, I, I, the, the deal was he had to come and meet my family. I said, if you can come fly down here and you meet my husband, it's the first time I ever asked my husband permission to do anything. And I said, if my husband gives me the green light, I'll do it. And then it was a little, you know, it kind of went from there. He came down, my, him and my husband are really good friends now. They, they've raced together. They, they, they eat meat together because my <laughs> Being from South America, he loves meat and he loves to cook uh, his Argentinian barbecues and James loves it. And anyway, it's just 
they clicked. And yeah. uh, nine years later, here I am. So that's kind of the fast track story, but there's a lot more in there. But it, it, that's I, I'm sure there is. I mean, and, and we've known each other for a few years and we, we met because we have a mutual friend that we were opening a Next Home franchise and it ended up being in your hometown. So yeah. we've always kind of stayed close because I got to actually meet you in person, which is different than I think a lot of like the broker owners and the franchise Next Homies. But I love the brand. I mean, and share a little bit about what it's like to be a Next Homie. Like what's Next Home all about? Because I think it's just the most interesting, amazing brand. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, it's funny because when James came to me and said, I want to, you know, I really want to create a new brand. And, you know, I said, look, they're all like, just fix what we have in this industry because there are some really incredibly strong brands, legacy brands that, you know, they they have already captured the hearts and souls of many viewers, right? And James is like, no, we're going to do it differently. And I said, well, every brand I talked to, because I, I worked with the major brands and the largest independent brokers in the U.S. And I said, they all say they're different, but you pop the hood. They're all the same. They just wear a different color suit. They're all powered by the same platforms. They're all using the same old, outdated, stodgy tech. The brands have not been re-looked at. And, and you know, this is 2014, right? Twenty, Actually, 2012. started. Our conversation started in 2012. And when James sat down with me probably a year and a half later and really it shared his vision, it matched how I always viewed running the sales team at Realtor.com and at Trulia. And my strategies has always been, you know, while everyone's out here focusing on that top 20%, you got the, what I would call the CB and B plus players, right? The small to mid size mom and pop brokerages, which is actually what is the heart and soul of real estate. If you look at the small to mid-sized broker, mom and pop company and agent teams, that's over 80% of the makeup of our industry. So everyone's fighting over this top 20%. And I was like, this is really brilliant. This is exactly what I would do. And I would sell, you know, brokers and agents at Realtor.com and even at Trulia. I never called the Ebby Hallidays and the Michael Saunders and the Kais and, and these big giant you know giant brands because they're never going to take my call so what i would do is sell around them and then i would get the phone call and almost force them to call me and say wait a minute why are you dealing with all these small companies i'm the number one in the market and i would tell them because you'd never take my call so that was always my strategy so when you think about the small to mid-sized broker they are incredible they're independent for a reason right and they don't want to be handcuffed by you know, these rules and these brands and this, this is the way to do it. Fit your square peg in our round hole. And if it doesn't work, you shove it in, right? And this is the only formula that you can be successful, right? And so I really, really liked how it was go after these small to mid-sized brokers. They need, out of anybody, they're the ones that need the most help with tech, training, support, technology, branding, being a part of something bigger, but still understanding and respecting the fact that they're in their local market and they know it better than we do. And to be able to come along someone and say, hey, you have an incredibly strong brand. I don't want you to lose your identity to join my franchise. But what I do want to do is come alongside you and partner with you because you can't do it all. There is a ceiling for everyone. If you're an independent broker and you're a team leader, you have everything. You're the marketer, the technologist, you're the trainer, you're the accountant, you're the marriage counselor, you're the, <laughs> um, you know, the therapist, the janitor, the secretary. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And if we can alleviate some of those off of your plate and allow us to use our buying power with over mm -hmm. 6,000 agents and 630 offices nationwide, obviously that's not where we started. If we can uh, focus on that and be that for you and bring you the best tech KB core inside real estate is one of the best tech companies out there right now, the best CRM, the best websites that actually compete locally with the portals. And we can do the syndication and provide you the reporting. And then that allows you to be stronger and actually compete with these big brands, but still maintain your identity in your market. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is what every brand misses. Um, so many of these brands think, you ask them, what's the one thing that I get with X brand? And they're always going to say our brand. That's the number one thing that you're going to get. 
And you ask next on that, it's our people, period. Yeah. Because none of our brand doesn't exist, our tech doesn't, none of what we do matters if you don't have the right people. So I think so many companies forget that their customer, our customer at Next Home is the broker, the agent, the buyer, and the seller, right? And, and in many cases, the father-in-law and the mother-in-law too, because we have to navigate those relationships when we're helping people buy and sell their Next Home, right? So, and then when you look at our brand, we do exactly what we say. We are who we say we are. We help you buy and sell your next home. It's in our brand. Many, many, many of our competitors or friends in the industry, they use our brand name in their marketing. If you're looking to buy or sell in Simi Valley, call John Jackson, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So they're using my brand in their marketing and they don't even realize it. And I love it. So when our yeah. broker will, or agents will say, oh my gosh, they, they're copying us. Great. Awesome. And then now yeah. is it good for you to pick up the phone and say, hey, you're marketing our company. You may as well join our company. Use those opportunities instead of looking at it as a, they're copying us and get upset about it. Use those opportunities to find a way to connect and to bring them into your company and say, we clearly share some of the same visions. Let's sit down and have that conversation. So when you look at how our brand started, we chose orange for a reason. Uh, no one was using orange. Everyone was red, white, and blue, red and black, blue and white, green and white, or some iteration. And, you know, even Weicker, one of the oldest, most legacy brands in the market or in the industry, you know, some people are like yellow and black. Yeah, no one else is using it. So yeah. people remember them. Now, Weicker, it's a very East Coast heavy brand. You don't see them a lot on the West Coast or even in a little bit in the Central. But like in the on the East Coast, when you see yellow... You might think of Weikert. When you see orange, we want you to think of Next Home. And then our 100%. dog, Luke, he's in the background. Yeah. We're like 65 places. And that is a way for us to connect emotionally with people without saying, you want to buy it? You want to buy it? Want to buy it? Want to buy it? Yeah. I'm a realtor. I'm a realtor. I'm a realtor. Right? So getting people to say, hey, what's with the orange dog? It creates the opportunity for you to share a story. Because my, my Luke story is going to be different than your Luke story. That'll be different than, you know, Stephen's Luke story or Jennifer's Luke story or whoever, right? You ask James about Luke, he's going to give you the CEO and his affirmation with Luke. Because he thought it was a crazy, he's like the dumbest idea I've ever heard of, right? <laughs> and then when you start to think about, okay, well, when you see a duck, what company do you think of? Aflac. Oh, okay. Now when you see an ostrich, what do you think of? Liberty Mutual, right? You, yeah. You see Clydesdales. Some people say Wells Fargo. I say Budweiser because, well, I'm from Texas, <laughs> right? So we all have, you know, you, it, we have these mascots, right? No, mascots are just for colleges. You know, Remax has a mascot. A balloon is not a mascot. It's not a mascot, right? Yeah. And so, and I never really understood the balloon. I do because I know that, you know, real, real estate to the max and I get it. But how does that resonate with me as a buyer or a seller? It doesn't, right? Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is people say, oh my gosh, you're the first company to use a dog in, in your branding. No, actually we weren't. Coldwell Banker, a lot of people don't know this, but Coldwell Banker, their original low, uh, mascot was a golden retriever. There's only I one. I did not know that. A lot of people don't know that. But if you don't know why you're doing it and you don't create a story behind the value of that dog, people don't get it and therefore they won't use it. And then, and we get it a lot. Like, I, what's with this orange dog? Like, oh, I'm not using that. I think it's silly. Okay. Well, when you put that in front of your yard summary and it, yeah. is a dog, and it has a dog collar that says, if lost, my name is Luke call Charis and it's got my phone number, who's going to steal the sign? The kids. The kids are going to steal it. They're going to take it home. Mom and dad are going to see it. They're going to have a coronary. You're like, oh my gosh, where did you get this? You stole this from someone's yard? Yeah. But guess what? It has your number on it. So when they call you, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. But my kids were riding the neighborhood. They took your, yard, your, your dog sign. What do you say? No problem. It happens all the time. Actually, that's exactly what it's for. For the kids to steal it, bring it home for you to call me. And when you're buy thinking about buying or selling, give me a call. And that's it. Yeah. Who do you think they're going to remember when they want to know the value of their home? What's that company? That one with the orange dog? Yeah. And we Google it and you're going to find this. So anyway. I mean, my kids have multiple loops yeah. and even uh, like my team and everything like that. Absolutely love it. Like they've gotten it, some of their care packages and stuff like that. 
it, it it does. It starts a conversation or even just like email signatures. Like we'll get questions about our email signatures because there's a, a look on it and they're like, what's up with that? And it just, it starts a conversation for sure. And I think that's such like a unique thing. You know, there's a tremendous culture within Next Home and then kind of layering on. I always love like your member services team and, and they layer on Luke and you layer on the culture and it's, it's just awesome what you guys have built. Well, thank you. You know, we have the vision, but the people are the one that bring the formula together, right? You have all these ingredients. When you bake a cake, if you don't yeah. have eggs, right? You have your box of flour, but you need ingredient. I mean, if you're like me, some people are amazing and they can do like homemade cakes. Definitely not. I could make a prime rib like no one's been <laughs> making a cake. It is not. I leave that to my daughters. But you need all the ingredients, right? And no ingredient. You think the flour is the most important because there's more of it. And really, you know, you've got the egg, you've got sometimes water or milk or some other things. And every single piece of those, if you make a cake without sugar, I mean, it's not going to taste good. If you make a cake without milk or an egg, it may not be fluffy. I don't really know. Yeah. I'm not a just when it comes to baking, but <laughs> I'm I know up here. Right. Is that you, all of these things create our company and, you know, you can stand from a main stage or you do a pod or tell people what you want to do. But the reality is, is does it resonate? And if it does, what does it look like in 630 offices over 6,000 mm -hmm. agents? And, you know, we do our annual conference every year. It'll be in Vegas next year. And some people, when you tell them like, oh, you've got to go to this conference and like another real estate conference. Uh, I, they're no, they're not valuable. And I tell people, go one. And something magical happens. You have all these people you know, from different parts of the country, different religious, pol political uh, background, sexual orientation. I mean, everything all over the country. And when we get together, there is this orange flow, this movement happens in and it's this cadence in the room. And every now and then you see a couple people in there in the room that just aren't flowing with you. Those people usually don't make it back at all. We usually so have to entire mass them to leave or they already know and they've already made the decision to leave. You know, when I'm bringing on brokers to the company, um, we are very selective. We don't take everyone we talk to. And then, you know, upon renewal, uh, it's a mutual decision. And, and, and sometimes not everyone makes it past their first yeah. year, fifth year. So. That's so funny that you talk about the orange because... We were at lunch at the last conference, went with a bunch of other broker owners and agents, and we all walked in, and the, the hostess or someone next to us was like, do you guys realize you all match? And I was like, oh, weird. Oh, my God. How weird. We're all wearing orange. And we like, just all started busting up laughing because, yeah, everybody wears orange. I've never had such... I was like telling my husband the last time I went, I was like, this is the only company that I'll go buy a whole wardrobe for yeah. before I go to a conference. Like, like the hey, only one michael um cores and like anything orange on my way amazon just sells out we were in houston this last year and i think we bought every orange cowboy hat on the internet because it was pretty much impossible to find one so yeah it, it, it is definitely a unique culture and really if you think about it you know if if i were to push this color or similar color of box across the table what company comes to mind tiffany right yeah. So when you, you don't even need to put a logo. You could just be, you could see a door walking through a neighborhood because this was a popular color for a little bit. And, you know, like, oh my gosh, the Tiffany blue door, right? And you, when you own a color, I mean, in California, our Caltrans, so our freeway people also wear orange, but <laughs> yeah. it's a different color orange, right? So yeah. in it might mean a little different, but in Florida, it could be the Gators. It could be, you know, or, you know, Tennessee, but in the real, you know, the reality is, is, you're right. We we want to own and dominate that color orange and no one's using it. The number one rule in marketing is to be different. And so often in our industry, agents and brokers and teams alike, they all think like, I have to have this logo. And I look at it, I'm like, it's black and red. And I like that's literally every single real estate logo on the planet is either red, white, and blue or black and red. Listen, you will not find a more patriotic person in the world than me. I mean, if I were to rip off my skin, there would be an American flag. <laughs> yeah, like rip. I know it sounds gross, but it, the reality is, is I'm very patriotic. <laughs> and I, the last thing I want is my logo to look like everybody else's logo. Yeah. Right? So, you know, and 
it's like our flag for our country, right? It's it's a unique flag. And when you see it, for the most part, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I don't cry a lot at all. But I, I mean, you you get someone that can bounce out the national anthem with that flag being raised, and I am lost. I lost. I didn't cry when my kids were born, but I'll cry <laughs> when it's being raised. I know it's cr- it's so sad. Are are we supposed to cry when we have kids? I, I missed I, that I, memo. I, I, <laughs> I cried. Nineteen years I've been crying because <laughs> my money's gone, my sanity's gone. <laughs> I think like about five minutes ago, I had one kid with like, that was like licking the window outside my office. That's yeah. what I want to cry. I'm like, what are you doing? Right. Oh you my know, gosh. You know, that immune system. I tell my kids, <laughs> the rails, just lick them all. <laughs> my, my youngest for sure. Well, let, let's pivot a little bit because we were talking about the other, you know, the other day that you recently made a hire that's made a really big difference in your life. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I've always attributed my success to just the fact that I work hard, right? I have everywhere that from the minute I started working my first job at Dairy Queen and all the way through after high school, I went into the military. And then from there, I started working in shoes. And then, you know, the the, the story goes on. And I've never left a position. I've never started a company and left in the same position. I've always, you know, had some managerial whether it was, you know, in Dairy Queen, I was the, the youngest um, at that time on record man, uh, shift leader. When I went in the military, I grabbed, was promoted out of boot camp. And then, you know, when I went to Kathy Jean, I started as a shoe salesman. And then ultimately I ran, the, I was third in command in the company, running the enti- all the regions and the districts. And, you know, same thing at Realtor, I left. And then Trulia, and then ultimately, actually, I, I said that I've never started the, the comp- position where I'm at. And I'm still the same position at Nexum, so I got to talk to James about that. But <laughs> kidding. Um, so I've just always been, not been successful. It hasn't been easy. Um, there's It's a lot of sacrifice, right? And so... For some reason, I lost my voice and my confidence and my ability to understand. It's like I hit the age of 40 and I'm 46 now. So six years ago and I, I just started to like really kind of feel like I was losing myself and I couldn't, you know, and then so I I continued to do what I was doing and I just struggled. Like I I was struggling mentally. I was struggling in, in my personal relationships. I was struggling at work. No one knew it because you never show that. But we had a lot of transition here at Next Home. There was, you know, a lot of, we are very, very competitive as executives. And we're very, you know, we all have our own role within the company. And I just couldn't understand how I fit in. And at first I was upset with my partners because it's like, how do you not see, right, um, how I fit in? And you know, I was mad at them. And then I got mad at everybody, everybody. And, and, you know, we made, we had a transition and then uh, we hired someone by the name of Jim Fischetti. And he's like got almost 40 years in this business. And I don't know what it was about Jim, but I would watch him and he's very quiet, but you know, he would get on stage. He would command the stage in a way like no one, none of, none of our people have ever met him. And the way he would deliver, I was like, gosh, and he's so different than James and Keith and and others and I was like man and so he was here for about eight months and we have interacted quite a bit and finally I I don't know why I cared about his opinion because I typically never do but I got on the phone with him one day and I was like hey you know what you worked with me you know for eight months now and I'd really like to know like what it is about me you know that where do you think that I could you know get better what do you think that I could do better And I was very concerned for some weird reason about this person and their opinion of me. And, you know, he did the best thing. I don't think anyone in the world would do it this way. But he says, you know what? He goes, I'm your colleague and I don't think that that's for me to answer. But I am going to introduce you to somebody that helped me. And I was like, okay. And now in that time, he did not know this, but I was thinking about this idea of coaching. Not me being a coach, but me finding someone because I will tell you, uh, three years ago, I hired a life coach. Some of you refer to them as therapists. I don't need therapy. I just need coaching. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> I found this woman, um, actually, through uh, the story doesn't matter, but she was very eager to talk with me. And I said a lot of choice words about how that was never going to happen. 
And ultimately, we came full circle. I reached out to her and it changed my life. And I realized that, you know, there's some things that, you know, a lot of what creeps up in our business and personal relationships and friendships and family relationships is always stem to something that has happened in our past. And they call it trauma now. That's like the, the key word, right? Like your trauma. And so you have this trauma, right? But you push it down, you push it down, you push it down, and then eventually it rears its head. Um, and there's a, an incredible book called The The Body Keeps Score. And my life coach decided that I needed to read that book. It was a very difficult read and it helped me. But when I was talking, you know, Jim saying, I think you need to do this. So it encouraged me to start interviewing coaches. And then I was doing that. And then I had this conversation with Jim. So I do believe the universe talks to you sometimes. So here I am thinking maybe I need a, yeah. life, you know, a business coach. And then, you know, Jim's like, I want to introduce you to this lady. And so I interviewed these coaches and I interviewed Cherie and I really liked her. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll do this. And so I had to decide if it was uh, worth it uh, because it's very expensive to hire a coach, by the way. Yeah. Um, you know, like I have a personal trainer and, you know, my husband's always like, why do you have a personal trainer? I was like, because I need accountability. And I used to never need issues. I never had issues working out, but, and they push you, right? And they, they, they take you to uncomfortable places and they make you dig in and they make you dig deep. And what I realized with Cherie is she, and, and it's funny because she, her word is unstoppable. She, like, you are unstoppable. This is her workbook. And uh, what she did for me, I already know that I'm unstoppable. Like, that I didn't need someone to tell me because I, I just, you tell me no and I'm going to do it, right? Like, I don't need someone to say, you're unstoppable. I know I am. That I didn't have an issue with. But I needed permission for some weird reason to give myself permission to just be and to be me. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people think about you because it's none of your business. You will find your people in this world. And here I am raising two daughters, telling them, like, when you look in the mirror, you know, you got to lo love the person that looks back at you. And if you don't, but I was having a problem. I, I wasn't, you know, using my own words. So anyway, what, what Cherie did was she unlocked me. So for me, my word with her is a lock. Uh, she unlocked a part of me that gave me permission to say, you know what, all of the things that you think about yourself, no one else thinks like that. You know, I always felt like my biggest failure is the fact that I never got a college degree. And that was always something important to me. I could have been, you know, one of the first people, you know, in my family to go to college, you know, but it's like, well, yeah, but you went in the military. Like, that's an achievement. Yeah, but I didn't get my degree. I didn't have that piece of paper on the wall that validated me, right? And so, you know, so that was one thing. And I've always kind of mentally held back because of that. When you're sitting at a table, when I was at Trulia, I would sit at the table and these people had, you know, some of them had double masters, doctorates. These were, you know, people that graduated from Stanford and Harvard and some of the best colleges in the world. And, you know, I'm sitting there telling them X, Y, and Z. And they're looking at me like, you have no idea what you're talking about. But I did. And, you know, and I knew that I did because, you know, I, I, I have a degree in the School of Hard Knocks. And if you could <laughs> real estate, you could pretty much, you know, so it was all this stuff. So hiring Cherie allowed me to really like the person that I see. Don't, I don't apologize anymore for being too much and too loud and too all over the place and too all the things that I've heard in both business and in, in my personal life or in, in, in whatever. And so she just allowed me to see, I guess, what other people see in me that I, I still struggle that part with when I get a compliment. You know, I'm constantly told by my business mentor, Keith Robinson, this is the time, Charis, where you shut up and you say thank you. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. Thank you. You know, and I have to like, and he does that to me. He's like, take it in, listen to it, let it resonate, take a breath and say thank you. Right? Yeah. So, and I think as women, and I, I can't speak for men, right? I'm not a man. I don't know what a man goes through, but I know I'm a fighter, right? I've had to fight for a lot of things in my life, a lot of things that I, and things that I've achieved and I'm tired, right? Of fighting. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so now I'm just going to be, and I'll tell you, I've watched my progression over the last three years when I started down this journey, I have seen myself in video change. And my demeanor has changed, my confidence, I, I stand closer to the edge of a stage, I hold words a little bit longer than I used to, and 
my thoughts kind of flow a little bit differently. Instead of trying to get it all out to prove something, I just leave it where it ends. And if someone has a question, they can call me and I don't apologize for it. Right. So, anyway, love that. That's what Sheree has done. It has only been eight months. I can't actually nine months now. And I Lord knows where it's going to go in the next 19 months, but it's fun. I love that. I feel like we all need coaches at some point. I just got out of my first year in a coaching program. I've never done that before. I never really thought I was a coachable human being. Like I'm just super stubborn and I'm just going to go, you know, I don't need someone to give me homework because I'm going to go do it anyways. But there's different levels of what you're going to get out of coaching, right? Like that's kind of what I got out of my last year of coaching too, is just like people do want to hear what you have to say. Like we're all super different. And it's funny because I've got two girls too. And it's like, we tell them all this stuff to be strong and love yourself and all these things. And then we don't do it for ourselves. Yeah. It's just, you're like, duh. Yeah. <laughs> like, now I just paid all this money to hear the same thing. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. And I, I'm, yeah, I mean, I pay her quite a bit of money, you know, to, to tell me, I mean, I have a thousand books behind me and a thousand books around the corner and a thousand books in my house and. You know, you can read, but for some reason, when it comes through here and it goes here, it sits differently when it's a verbal app yeah. and you have to say it out loud. And sometimes I'll say things and I'm like, oof, that really was yucky. Like yeah. it just came out and it tasted so bad. You know, uh, the word vulnerability is very difficult for me. And that is my next life coach is is that vo- being vulnerable showing your emotions my daughter i have two as i as i said and i have a 19 year old in college now and a 14 year old and you know it's it's funny because my my youngest it's like she has this goal to see her mom cry and she's like i, I just never seen you cry do you cry and that's like i do think i yeah, i mean everyone cries but i never do it in public and i'll tell you my oldest the same she's like you just you know i'm not a very I'm not a very, I'm not the mom where like, you know, like my best friend, like her kids, like when they are, when they have a boo-boo or whatever, they go to their mom. My girls go to their dad because <laughs> I'm going to be like, just go clean it off, put a bandaid on it and figure it out. You know, so that motherly instinct of, of nurturing and coddling and all of that, I don't have. I think I have it. I just won't allow myself to go there. And as I'm getting older and as my daughters are getting older now, it's it's a little bit different. When your daughters look at you, and, and Kaylee just recently did this to me. She came back from, from college and she's like, Mom, like what you have given me is so much confidence. And you raised me in a way where like, you know, I don't have to take shit from anybody. I don't know if I can say that, but I just did. Um, yeah. Like, <laughs> And if, if this is in my room, I'll find another room. And so, I mean, for me, if I, I you know, I, I say every night in my prayers, if I die tomorrow, just I feel like my girls are going to be okay. Right. And that's all. I never wanted kids. And for a lot of reasons. And I realize now I need to change that. Actually, I was having a conversation with Kaylee last night about it. And I said, because she said, you're just talking to somebody. She's like, I don't want kids. And I said, you know, you need to change that because I always said I didn't want kids. It wasn't that I didn't want kids. I just didn't want kids with a partner that wasn't going to meet me halfway. That's the difference, right? Mm, and so yeah. like, when I met my husband, I mean, and this was 28 years ago, I was young and I was, I had, you know, I'm, I'm from Texas. I'll say that like 25 times, uh, but I was already engaged out of high school, right? Because, you know, if you're not engaged by the age of 18, there's something wrong with you. And I went off and I came back and I, of course, I did not marry that guy and came to California and the day I met my husband, I went home that night and I said to my mom, I met the man I'm unmarried and I was never getting married. She's like, okay. And eight years later, we got married and then I was never going to have kids. And my grandfather always said, if you meet the right person, you will have kids. And yeah. he was right. And I did. So now I just say all the time, I'm never going to win the lotto because at that <laughs> point that is, you know, it's <laughs> gonna so I guess you have to play it though. So anyway, but like, you know, when you, when you're looking at your daughters, you know, especially girls. I did. If I was going to have kids, I was only going to have boys. I was a sports girl. I'm a tomboy. But there's a reason for everything. And and I truly believe that I was the vehicle for both of my girls to come to this earth to to show me and teach me lessons. And if we take time to look at our kids and listen to our kids and invite our kids at the table to the table, it's very different. My girls were always. I never had a structure for them. A lot of my girlfriends, you know, everything was structured. 
And I kind of do that with my business. I, I take things as they come. And I was never going to be a stay-at-home mom. I'm not built that way. There is no way. I told my husband, if someone's going to stay home, it'll be you. It's not me. You would have had 25 kids. I told him, I'll give you two after that. Find another host because I'm done. Um, and, you know, and we do laugh about it, but he always says like, just one more. And I'm like, mm -mm. this body is closed for baby business. Uh -huh. I'll be a surrogate. Anybody want me to be a surrogate? I'm all in on that. But I do not want to raise children anymore. Yep. Same. <laughs> this is why, this is why we're friends. Is that the same thing? I'm like, no. The second I was done with baby stage, I like, I threw all that stuff. It was like in the garage and I was like putting it up for free. I was like, we are done here. I, I had yeah. two. Like, yeah, no. that's, that's done. That's <laughs> the other so day, funny. My husband sees a video of our youngest and he's, she was a baby and he goes, don't you just miss this stage? I said, no, not at all. I do not miss that stage. Zero. Do I miss that stage? Very cute. Very cute. I think we just had this conversation like two weeks ago. My husband's like, are you sure we don't want to have one more? And I'm like, no, I don't. I'm just finding myself again. Like, yeah. I'm finally, like, feel like I have my own life. They're in school. Yeah. And and sorry to everybody that's listening. If you if that that is, like, your thing, that is totally fine for you. I love my kids wholeheartedly. But the whole, uh-uh. Like, because I'm, I'm responsible for those kids all the time. Like, who takes them to the doctors? And, you know, that's why I started my companies, because I had kids I wanted to be at home. But it is like the it's kid, funny. kids, the, your, I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, we say this tongue in cheek. If you follow me on Facebook, you know my entire life is around, revolves around my children. Same. And, but it's at the same time, like, you know, what are you willing to sacrifice? And I, I felt bad. I felt so guilty as a mom in business because I didn't take Kaylee to school the first six years of her life. My mother did. So I missed a lot of that. So it's, you know, it's sacrifice. What are you willing to sacrifice to achieve things that you want? Uh -huh. And now it's different, right? Like I, I want to take her to college. I want to be with her at college. I want to do all these things with her. But I, you know, we all have, it, it, you raise, every one of us raise our kids a different way. There's no manual. Um, and we'll find out, you know, I'm sure they'll sit on some therapist's life coach's couch one day and talk about yeah. all the things, right? Yep. And mm -hmm. we just do, you know, we do the best we can. And we hope it's enough. And if not, we try harder the next day and just try to be better than we were the day before. And I apply that to business too. So it's just funny. I always say that to my husband. I'm like, what exactly do you think we're doing to mess up our children in some way? Like we're trying very hard. I think we're good parents, but we're doing something that they're going to be talking about 20 years from now that my parent did X, Y, Z. There's nothing oh, we can do. I know do. my perfectionism, like all, like I, I know they're going to suffer from that. Like, and now I learn, you know, it's progress, not perfection, you know. You have to be the best, you know. So, it, you know what? They'll mess their kids up, too. It'll be fine. Yep. Won't we all? <laughs> well, Charis, this was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing just your life journey, your business journey, your parenting journey. This has been so exciting to hear from you. If anybody wants to get in touch with you, where should they reach out to? Sure. So, you can email me, charis at nexthome.com. And I say that laughingly because if you don't know how to spell Charis, then it's probably not that easy. So it's C-H-A-R-I-S at nexthome.com. You can always text me, find me on social media. Uh, it's Charis Nash Moreno, N-A-S-H. That's my maiden name. You know, or you can hunt my assistant down. She knows where I'm at. <laughs> oh, no. So just Jen, the Chief Charis Wrangler. I really appreciate you allowing me to be on here. Yeah, I feel like we talk more about our kids, which is kind of funny than business. But, you know, raising kids is just like, raise, just like uh, running a company. Um, it's older children. <laughs> <laughs> think about it it's so funny. In there, but in a good way and you know i appreciate the opportunity i love this industry you know there's a lot i know we have to go but like there's a lot of noise out there right now with lawsuits and interest rates and inventory and you know the home sales being down and all these things but you know if i could leave anyone with anything is manage the things you can control we cannot and i say this all the time you can control what you feed your mind you can control what you feed your body you can control how many calls you make or how many people you talk to in the day. You can't control the market. You can't, and you, but you can control how people feel when they leave your com the conversation with you. And so, if you're out there and you're lost and you're broken and you don't know what to do and your business is struggling, do something. Whether it's go to the gym, whether it's pick up the phone and just make one phone call to one person, that could be the the catalyst or the the fire that you need to to ignite something beyond you. And that's the one thing is don't stay still. Don't use fear. Um, use fear as fuel and yeah. just control the things you can. You can't control the market. You can't control the eight rates. 
the lawsuits, any of those things, but you can control what you do every single day. So love it. Yeah. Love it. That's such a great actionable thing for any of our listeners to to do because that's what we do with a lot of our clients is like, where do you normally get your business? Let's focus on that little thing. You can't control all of these, the purchases and the lawsuits and all that stuff. You can't do anything about that. You nope. can do something about your own business. You can. So awesome. Well, thanks so much, Charis. Have a great day. Hey, you too. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs>